Made to become an object of sexual gratification, Sarah Bartman was an African woman who saw the good, the bad, and the very ugly. Of the Khoi Khoi tribe found in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, Bartman's prominent feminine features garnered attention from the opposite sex and subjected her to a life of harassment, slavery, and objectification in Europe. First, who was Sarah Bartman and how was she tragically exploited and objectified? Sarah, also referred to as Sarche Bartman, was born into the Khoi Khoi tribe near the Gamtus River, known today as the Eastern Cape of South Africa, to the family of a poor farmer around the year 1789. She was named Sehura by her parents and later renamed Sarche by the Dutch, who colonized their region. Sarah lost her parents at a very young age and spent her childhood on the farms, after which she moved to Cape Town in search of work. Some reports said that she had gotten married in her teenage years, but her husband had been murdered during one of the colonial raids. This was before she moved to Cape Town. The Dutch had colonized South Africa and many indigenes were forced to migrate to Cape Town to work for the colonists. Sarah had an unusually protruded backside that made her buttocks very pronounced. This was caused by an illness called statopedia. In Cape Town, Sarah eventually found work as a maid on the farm of two Dutch brothers, Peter and Hendrik Caesar. Sarah's peculiar figure was bound to be noticed and in no time, the Caesars began to make money off her by parading her at the city's major hospital. This drew the attention of Alexander Dunlop, a surgeon and friend of the Caesars who believed Sarah had greater prospects in Europe and offered to take her to England. Dunlop managed to convince the Caesars, particularly Hendrix, to take on the offer and a document was prepared for Sarah to sign. The document supposedly stated that Sarah was going to work as a servant but would be paraded for entertainment. She would also be paid a certain percentage of her earnings and would be allowed to return home after five years. However, Sarah could not read or write, and there is no proof of what the document truly entailed or if she willingly signed a document she did not understand. When the trio got to London in 1810, Sarah began parading in shows. She was first paraded at the Piccadilly Circus and nicknamed the Hoddentot Venus, a term now considered demeaning. Sarah was clad in very revealing costumes for her shows. Men and women paid to watch Sarah and some even paid extra to be able to touch or poke her. Reports show that they more than just touched her, rather she was ogled, felt and touched in sexually perversive ways. Sarah's figure was sexually appealing to the men, while the women were mostly envious and only attended the shows to see the African woman who had come to distract their men. On the other hand, some people considered her a freak and saw her figure as monstrous and animalistic. Sarah Bartman became a popular spectacle in England. Her sharply contrasting physical features with that of the European women spiked their curiosity about her. She even influenced the fashion trends during the 19th century. Women began to wear dresses that had padded humps at the back, named the bustle. They believed that being like Sarah would help them secure their men's attention. Sarah was closely managed by the Caesars and in very unlikely terms. When she refused to be touched inappropriately, she would be threatened with a whip right in front of the audience. So far away from home and with no one to help, Sarah had no choice but to endure the degrading treatment. At some point, it seemed like Locke smiled on her, but it was only temporary. 
Members of a slave trade abolitionist group called the African Association had gotten wind of how badly Sarah was treated. They charged her keepers, the Caesar brothers and William Dunlop to court for forcefully parading Sarah as a freak show. But the defendants provided a document which Sarah supposedly signed. When called upon to take the witness stand, Sarah, who had become multilingual, been fluent in speaking the Dutch and English language, and later on French, defended herself and her keepers, saying that she wasn't held against her will or been mistreated. The case was dismissed, but her popularity increased even more. She went for shows further across England and even as far as Ireland. After a while, Sarah Bartman's popularity waned as people began to lose interest in her parades. She had spent about four years in England. Sarah was then sold to an animal trainer, Sean Rue, who moved her to Paris. This is where her situation is said to have taken a turn for the worse. In Paris, she was exhibited in circus shows and sometimes placed in an animal cage. Witnesses recall that at some point, she was paraded alongside a baby rhinoceros. In the circuses, she was made to sing and dance like an animal to amuse the audience. Rowe also paraded her at the private parties of the wealthy. It is believed that he also made her go into prostitution while being paraded at wild and drunken gatherings. Sean Rowe made a lot of money off Sarah but gave her nothing. When scientists approached him to make science-related paintings about Sarah, he willingly agreed. Some accounts state that Sarah agreed to be painted nude, while some also state that she refused to remove the piece of clothing that covered her private parts. The French soon lost taste for Sarah's shows and she was subjected to a life of severe poverty. After being sold from one man to another and exploited for so long, Sarah's life was cut short by an undiscovered inflammatory disease. As a result of this, there were speculations that she had either died of pneumonia, alcoholism, syphilis, or smallpox. On December 29, 1815, Sarah Bartman died, thousands of miles away from home and penniless despite the many shows she had appeared in. She was about 26 years of age. When Sarah Bartman got to London, she got the opposite of the life she had been promised. In the document she supposedly signed, she was to be given an undisclosed percentage of her earnings and would return home after five years. Sarah never made it back home alive and it took her remains about 200 years to be granted a resting place. She had lived a short and miserable life, no thanks to the men who had taken advantage of her. A Frenchman who had seen her being paraded at a French ball said she had introduced herself as, My name is Sarah. Very unhappy Sarah. After her death, French scientist Georges Cuvier, who had been keenly interested in Sarah while she was alive, was allowed to dissect her. Not to conduct an autopsy to determine the cause of her death, but rather to quench the curiosity of many about what her sexual organs looked like and to prove the link between Africans and animals. During this time, Darwin's concept of evolution was just taking flight. Different scientists in the Western world were carrying out experiments to prove this theory. Sarah also had an elongated labia, which was derogatorily referred to as Hottentot's apron. This might have also led Cuvier to establish his thoughts on her being primitive and sexually insatiable. Cuvier had initially described Sarah as an intelligent woman with an excellent memory for faces, but had also ironically described her as having ape-like features and referred to her as the missing link between man and ape. He preserved certain parts of her body like her brain, genital organs and skeleton. 
A cast was also made of her body and was placed alongside her skeleton at the Paris Musée del Home for about 150 years. In 1994, South African President Nelson Mandela requested that the remains of Sarah Bartman be allowed to return home. The French government initially contested it, but after many protests and campaigns, as well as legal battles which lasted for about eight years, the request was granted. Sarah's remaining body parts were returned in March 2002. A burial place was chosen and in August 2002, Almost 200 years after she left her hometown, Sarah Bartman was finally laid to rest. She was buried in a small town named Hanke in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. This was believed to have been where she came from. Her burial place was declared a South African National Heritage Site and the Sarah Bartman Center for Women and Children, a center for domestic violence survivors, was also named after her in 1999. Sarah Bartman was a young, illiterate woman who was taken advantage of by every means possible. She had everything taken away from her, her dignity, privacy, and even her actual name. In 1811, she was baptized in the Manchester Cathedral and christened Sarah because they felt it would suit the audience better. No one knows if she did this willingly or was coerced to do so. Her life's story has been of a profound motivation to many African women who have refused to settle for the same fate as Sarah. Different books, movies and documentaries have centered around this woman who lived such a short life, a prominent one being The Life and Times of Sarah Bartman, produced in 1998 by Philip Brooks. Poet Diana Ferris, also from the same cohesion tribe as Sarah, wrote a poem titled, I've Come to Take You Home, which spurred the call for her remains to be returned. The book, The Mismeasure of Man, authored by Stephen J. Gold, in which he wrote about Sarah and criticized racial science, created further awareness about Sarah and filled the calls for her return. Her tragic exploitation further buttresses the degradation of Africans by the whites and the inferior treatment they passed through during colonial rule and even beyond. We always have more stories like this to talk about. So, don't hesitate to like and share this video with your friends. You can subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to receive the latest videos as they drop. Also, don't miss our next video on Otabenga, the tragic exploitation of an African man.